Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate. Today I'm interviewing Annie Sullivan. Hi, Annie. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. How are you? I am doing great. So can you tell me about your books? Yes. So I'm the young adult, an author of young adult books. Um, I have three books. My my third book just came out very recently. Um, so the first book is called A Touch of Gold, and it's about the cursed daughter of King Midas who has to set out to retrieve her father's gold when it gets stolen. And the sequel is the book that just came out. It's called A Curse of Gold, and it follows um, the daughter of King Midas. She tries to break the golden curse. And then my other book is called Tiger Queen, and it is a retelling of the short story The Lady or the Tiger. Um, kind of dealing with that infamous ending for anyone who's read it, uh, that cliffhanger ending. And it is about a warrior princess who fights suitors in an arena to win her right to rule. That sounds awesome. I'd actually never <laughs> heard of that short story before. Oh, so that sounds so, so cool. Story. You can find it. Um, your listeners can find it. You can find it. Just Google The Lady or the Tiger by Frank Richard Stockton. It's available for free online. It's really short, just a couple of pages, maybe two, three pages long. Um, but I read it in grade school and it stayed with me because it has a cliffhanger ending. That's just it's infamous. It's not even famous. It's infamous because it's it's that like oh, nail biting. Oh, wow. So in your book, do you answer the cliffhanger? Like, I do, you- do. I do. That was like one of the inspirations for the book was to give that story the ending it always should have had. That is so cool. So how did you work on coming up with the ending to that? Well, so long story short, when I read that story in grade school with my teacher, my teacher, you know, asked us, all right, class, what do you think happened in the end? And there's there's kind of two options that are open um, in the end of that story. And I was raised my hand because, of course, you know, I'm like Hermione Granger and I'm like oh, yes. <laughs> first one to raise my hand. And she's like, Annie, you know, what's what's the answer? And I said, well, it could be either. And I could just see the look of disappointment on her face of like, well, that wasn't the point. The point is to figure out which one it was based on the little information you're given. And so that just stayed with me that I was like, man, I I don't know this answer. And um, so, yeah, it was really about coming up with an ending that satisfied the entire story and gave a little bit more agency to the main character. That sounds so cool. Yeah, everyone go look up that short story because from what I'm hearing from you, it (laughs) sounds really great. And then go read Annie's books. Please do, everybody. Yes, please. (laughs) So what interested you in the story of King Midas? Well, I really love fairy tales. And then the idea behind the book almost came from when I was watching Pirates of the Caribbean as a kid growing up. And it got me thinking about all that cursed gold they have to find in that movie. And I was like, what if there was another way that they could do that? What if they didn't have to go after every single piece? What if they could absorb the gold or collect the gold or retrieve the gold in a different way? And so thinking about cursed gold got me to think about King Midas. You know, there's so many different versions of that myth. And in one version of the myth, he turns his daughter to gold. And I was Mm -hmm. thinking, you've got to have some lasting side effects if your father turns you to gold as a child, you know? So I really wanted to explore that story. I wanted to take a character that's often... um, you know, forgotten and overlooked in her story, which is the daughter of King Midas, and really see what would happen to her. What would her life be like after being turned to gold? Um, What would her relationship with her father be like after being turned to gold by him? So I really loved that idea of looking at it from a new angle. That sounds so cool. And actually, as you were saying, she's a looked over character. I had forgotten she was in the story. <laughs> but then when you just said that, it jogged my memory because I love I love that version because it's a little bit darker when he does turn her into gold in the end. Yes, exactly. And I mean, she's such just a means to an end in the original story so that her father realizes like, oh, well, I guess it was a bad idea to ask for, you know, to turn things to gold because, well, now I've turned my daughter to gold. Mm -hmm. So that's like her whole point in the original story. And I wanted to make her the main character and explore her story. And I love writing about strong female heroines. So I really just wanted to take her from a character who was a little bit softer and help her find her way. That sounds so cool. So can you give our listeners and myself too, um, (laughs) any like writing tips for writing strong female characters? Oh, yes. I mean, I think 
the most important thing is to realize that first and foremost, a strong female character doesn't have to like wield a sword or anything like that. You know, they can be witty, they can be smart, they can be funny, they can use all of those sort of things to get themselves out of trouble. You know, they can make jokes, they can use their mind, they can be like MacGyver and just like create things. They can be really good inventors. Um, so don't always think like, oh, the character has to be the strongest because in the beginning of A Touch of Gold, Princess Cora, who is the daughter of King Midas, um, she's a very soft character. She's actually, she's bullied. She has gold skin. So there's lots of rumors about her. You know, people think like, oh, she turned back into a statue at night or she leaves golden footprints or something like that. So she is a very soft character. She's very timid. But when she's forced to leave her safe palace behind and go out into the real world, that's when she really starts to blossom and come into her own. Um, so really think about your character arc. You know, how is your character going to progress? How are they going to go from one state to another? Are they going to be strong the entire time? Are they going to learn that they need to be a little bit softer or let people in? Um, that's kind of the case with with Princess Kateri and Tiger Queen, the book that's that's based off that short story we were talking about, because she's a very, you know, sword wielding character. Like she will cut you down in an instant but she almost has to learn to be a little softer, a little bit more open and, and learn to trust other people. Um, so that's kind of her character arc. So just recognize that there are a bunch of different ways that you can write a strong female character. It doesn't have to be that, you know, she's this sword wielding assassin or something like that. Yes. Thank you so much for the hat. Um, <laughs> so how do you write medieval fairy tales for the modern era? Oh, I mean, I just, it's my favorite genre, so I just love writing them. So I think the first thing you want to look at is what fairy tale are you going to write? You know, there's so many out there, and you can set them in so diff many different places. I mean, you could set it in space if you wanted to. You could make it contemporary. But I love that kind of medieval feel to it. I think there's just something so magical about that setting. So definitely pay attention to, to your setting. You know, figure out what the buildings look like, what the town looks like. How does a kingdom function? Do you have a king? Do you have a queen? Is it a monarchy? Um, you know, all those things are going to come into play. Also, is there magic in this world? Um, so yeah, it all starts off with just picking the fairy tale and then choosing the setting and making sure your characters and your story exist and work well within that setting so that you have things that go well together. So, I mean, if you're going to have pirates, you probably need to be by the sea. And if you're by the sea, you might have a slightly different landscape or even different, you know, holidays or things. They might have a fisherman's festival instead of a harvest festival because, you know, they live by the sea. So like all those little things are going to influence how you write the story and how the story is going to go. Yeah, totally. Um, so by that, it, by what you just said, it kind of sounds like you write outlines, do you? And like, oh. if so, how? <laughs> um, I actually am not a good outliner. Uh, I am what they call a pantster, which means I fly by the seat of my pants and I just write what comes to me. I did have to write an outline for Curse of Gold, um, which was a little harder. Um, I think it's, I almost can start, like if you're going on a road trip, right? start to think about the places you're going to need to stop along the way in order to get to your destination. So if you're starting in New York and you're driving to California, are you going to stop at the world's biggest ball of yarn? Are you going to stop at a gas station? Um, where are you going to eat? Where are you going to stay? Um, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it because your characters cannot just be driving 24 seven, you know, on this adventure, they need to have a moment to themselves, a moment to sleep, to eat, to relax. Because if your character is just go, 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 your reader's going to get worn out. Um, so keep that in mind when you are writing an outline, because it, it does come into play and it can be very important. Um, but yeah, I just love to kind of have a few little almost bullet points of like, we might meet a pirate or we might end up at this island um, or we might meet this mythological creature or all of a sudden dragons will show up, something like that. I like to have those kind of key moments and I like to know where we're going to end up. So I know kind of what we're aiming for. So those would kind of be my tips for writing an outline. Yeah, thank you. So when you are writing, do you get the thing? I know a lot of writers get this where they kind of like almost go into like a trance like state or like the characters kind of talk to them. Yes. So I actually listen to music when I'm writing and I'll listen to the same song over and over again for days or months or whatever on end. And one of the ways I know that I've come out of my kind of writing trance is that I'll start to hear the music again. So it's almost like I go into this place where I don't even hear the music and it just becomes kind of part of me or part of the background and it's just there. Um, but I'm so entrenched in the world and what's going on 
that I don't even hear it. I don't notice it. Um, but then when I start to notice it, I'm kind of like, oh, I must be getting tired or I'm at a good stopping place for today. Or I have writer's block and not sure where we're going. Yeah. Um, so how do you choose what song to listen to over and over like that? Oh, it depends. If I'm writing like an intense battle scene, there are a couple that I'll go to. Um, like the the battle song from Chronicles of Narnia is a cool one. I think it's just called The Battle. Um, if I'm writing really like upbeat scene, um, I'll pick like a fun song. And sometimes they have music or sometimes they have like lyrics and sometimes they don't. Uh, it just depends how I'm feeling. Um, if I can find a song that has like the feel to it of what I'm writing, I think that's that's the best part. Could you share a couple of the songs that you chose for like your new book, A Curse of Gold or any of your books? So um, one of the big ones, there's this song called, I think it's just called Gold by Brit Nicole. And it's just such a fun, upbeat song. And it's like, it keeps saying you're worth more than gold. Um, And it just really spoke to me when I was writing the books. Um, And so I love that one. For Tiger Queen, Tiger Queen, a big one was Roar by Katy Perry. (gasps) Um, because, you know, it's like, you're going to hear me roar. And that was all what that book was about, um, was hearing her roar and helping her find kind of the tiger within and helping her take her kingdom back. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of my, my favorite ones. I love that. Yeah. Those are great songs too. So do you hide any Easter eggs in your books? Oh, yes, I do. Actually, I hide quite a few. Um, and most of them only my family and friends are going to pick up on. But I hide a lot of names um, of people that I know within the book. So if you ever see like a mountain name something, or an animal or like a weird creature that you're like, okay, she totally made up that name. Try looking at it backwards and see what it spells. Um, also, I'll hide little things that just mean a lot to me. So like one of my favorite TV shows growing up, and I still love it, is The Twilight Zone from Mm the 60s, the old black and white show. And so in one of the intros to one of the seasons, one of the famous lines is, there's a signpost up ahead. You're now entering the Twilight Zone. Um, And so I actually hid that line, there's a signpost up ahead in A Curse of Gold. Um, and my editor tried to take it out because she was just like, why is this? I mean, I mean, there there was a signpost, but um, she was like, why is this line here? And I was like, it, it needs to stay. Well, yeah, that I, that's awesome. I love The Twilight Zone, too. It's so good. Oh, um, yes. Do you have a favorite episode? Oh, I'm trying to think. I've seen, I watched, I think I, I watched more when I was younger. I've seen oh, some mm-hmm. recently. I recently saw the movie. And I, oh, I love yeah. the one with the kid. Do you have a favorite? Oh, I love Eye of the Beholder, um, also known as The Private World of Darkness because it has two names. Um, I love... Um, uh, the monsters are doing Maple Street. Uh, people are alike all over. That's a really good one, you guys. And I think that actually is a huge influence on my writing is the Twilight Zone. You know, all the twists and things that you're not expecting and how well the stories are told. Um, so I think it has a huge impact on who I am as a writer and how I like to write twists into the book. So you mentioned the Twilight Zone had an impact. Do you have any other like film, TV, books, anything that oh. has had specific So many. I mean, Jane Austen. I love Jane Austen, her work. I mean, A Touch of Gold is a little bit of an ode to Pride and Prejudice in some ways um, that most readers won't pick up on. But um, if you know me, you know how much I love Pride and Prejudice. You can kind of see a little bit of it in there. Um, I love Meg Cabot. She wrote The Princess Diaries. She has a very, um, just very free flowing way of writing, very stream of conscious that I love and that really lets you get to know a character really well. So I'm definitely a fan of that. Um, Oh man, Marissa Meyer wrote Cinder. Love her books. Everyone, you guys can all go, if you're listening to this, you can go check out the rest in the feed for this podcast and you can actually hear me listen. You can actually listen to me interviewing Marissa Meyer too. That's amazing. Thank you. Oh, she is so wonderful. She's so nice. Oh, she is great. Yeah. Um, so are there any writers that you think are similar to you writing wise, like you use similar phrases or stuff mm-hmm. like that? Maybe, uh, Ellie Blake who wrote Frostblood, which is a really cool book about, um, a girl who has frost powers in a world full of people who have fire power. So she's a little bit similar, um, I love Stephanie Garber's work. I'm not sure I can compare myself to her. Her stuff is so, so well-written, very visceral. Like you just feel like you're there. So I love that. Um, 
I wish I could write as well as Mary Pearson, Kiss of Deception. If you haven't read that one, it's got a really cool point of view twist. Um, so I would love, love to be compared to them. That's great. So what made you want to be an author? Well, I grew up as a child who had asthma. And when I was little, I would have to take a lot of medications, one of which was like a big machine, like a big breathing machine that had a mask that you had to wear while it administered like a mist medicine. Um, and so when I was doing that, the machine was very loud. So it was really hard to like watch TV or really do much of anything. Um, but my mom would read to me because when she would sit behind me, I could hear her in my ear. And so when she would read to me, I wasn't a sick kid anymore. You know, I was Harry Potter under the stairs or a hobbit on an adventure or a princess, you know, going after a dragon or anything like that. And so I loved the adventure. I loved the escape. And I think even in today's world, there's there's so much negativity um, in the world that I love to create something where, where people can go and they can escape. Um, and I just have such an active imagination that I love sharing my stories with other people. And I hope that they bring them joy and that they can enter into these stories and maybe see what my characters go through and come back to the world a little happier, a little bit more prepared to face their obstacles in their own lives. I love that so much. That is like one of the sweetest stories I've ever heard on here. Aww, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that is really amazing. Do you, did you have any specific favorite books as a kid? Oh, man. I mean, I loved Madeline Lingle's Wrinkle in Time. Mm -hmm. That was a big one. Um, anything by Robin McKinley. Um, she had like The Outlaws of Sherwood, which I loved. Um, again, Meg Cabot grew up reading Meg Cabot all the time. Um, like Sister of the Traveling Pants, all that good stuff was just so important to me as a kid. Oh, like The Giver. I loved The Giver. Um, that was another good one. So, so many books. I, as you can tell, I spent a lot of time reading. So, yeah. So do you like writing or reading more? I know that's impossible. Oh, yeah, that's a hard question. I almost, I just love them both. I mean, I think they're just so different. Like reading, I can tell someone's a really good author if I'm not paying attention to the story. Like if I'm so invested in the characters and everything, I'm not like, oh, I see how they did that or I see how they're setting this up. So I love reading, but it, in some ways it's become harder because I do find myself analyzing everyone else's work to be like, okay, what are they doing here? How are they setting up this love story or this task or whatever it is? Um, and so I think sometimes I love writing more because it's really fun. I get to create my own stuff. But then sometimes if you've got writer's block or something, then writing is not as fun as you would hope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so do you have any tricks for how to get into a mindset for writing to like kind of curb writer's block? Yeah, I think, I mean, especially if you have writer's block, a couple things you can do is like, first of all, take a break, you know, that's a good way. Find a good critique partner, someone who you can talk it out with. Even if that person doesn't know the story, you'd be surprised that, but just talking to someone out loud about it helps you work out in your mind. Um, go for a walk, meditate, um, sleep on it. Uh, I, there's also this fun thing that I'll do sometimes. Um, it's called like a what if list. Cause I think as an author, the question, what if is one of the most important ones you can ask when you're coming up with a story, when you're writing a story. So if you're stuck, you can kind of, you can create this list of, tw I would say 20 things and you, you just write a list of what if this happened next, right? So if you're stuck, what if dragon showed up? What if there was an art heist? What if someone fell from the sky? I mean, they can be the most outrageous things, but they might trigger something in your mind to say, oh, well, what if that did happen? What if this thing over here happened? Um, and so they kind of say, like, you should get rid of the first five on your list because those are the most obvious ones and get rid of the last five because those are probably a stretch that you just struggled to come up with those and use the middle 10 and see if there's something in there that sparks anything that you could come up with. Um, so I think that can kind of help. And also, like I said, if you're listening to music, um, even turning on that song can be a great way to kind of, you know, almost just get yourself up and, and running because you hear that music and you start to associate it with your story. Um, so that can be a good way to, to keep you going and get you in that mindset. Yeah. Um, did you ever do NaNoWriMo? Because a lot of the things that you're saying on here, it remains me when I, I did NaNoWriMo remote class actually a while ago oh, and a lot of the things you're saying I, I had learned in that class and I was wondering if you learned it from there as well 
Sadly, no. I think these are the things I picked up along the way. Um, I always tell myself I'm going to do it. And then I always get so swamped with other things that I tried it once and I lasted like three days. Um, it's so much fun. You should try it again. I know all my like writing friends do it. And they're like, it's like the best thing ever. And I'm like, okay, someday, maybe this year, maybe this year, I'll finally have time to get around to it. Last year, I was traveling almost every weekend in November for, for book stuff. So maybe this year we can be, this can be the year. Yes. On this podcast, we fully support NaNoWriMo. It is amazing. Yes. I've talked yes. about it with people before. Oh, I've heard so many good things. I have a friend who actually, I'm from Indiana. So I have a friend who helps run kind of the Indiana local chapter and she does such a great job and they, they do such fun activities. So I highly encourage anyone out there to get involved. They're very welcoming communities, just, just wonderful people. Yes. Everyone, please do that. And you too, Annie, you would yes, love I it. Know. Hey, maybe you might show up and you'll see Annie Sullivan there and you'll be like, where have I heard that name? Yes, that would be great. Um, so do you have a favorite fairy tale? Oh, that's, oh, I love every fairy tale, but I would have to say I love Beauty and the Beast. And that may be influenced by the fact that she gets a library in the Disney movie, <laughs> um, which obviously I love libraries. <laughs> so I do love that. And while well, not strictly a fairy tale, I also love Robin Hood a lot. I've always just kind of had a soft spot for Robin Hood. So I definitely love those guys a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, me too, for sure. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say, do you have a favorite? I want to know now too. Oh, well, that's a hard one because I think my favorite, yeah, it's probably Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid's my Ooh. favorite Disney movie, but the yes. fairy tale is so much darker. Oh, right. And it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so many of them are so much darker. I mean, I could have taken a touch of gold and gone really dark and just written it from the father's point of view when he turns his daughter to gold and then she never gets turned back. I mean, that's how dark some of the originals are. In Cinderella, you've got the stepsisters, you know, cutting off their heels and their toes in order to fit into the shoe. And the man, crows pecking at their eyes. Yeah, it's yes. <laughs> yes. That's a great but, one, too. The Cinderella oh. fairy tale specifically is my favorite. Oh, see. There you go. I mean, yes, there are so many good ones out there. I would love to write retellings of like pretty much every fairy tale if I could, if I had the time. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think of, like, do you enjoy watching or reading fairy tale adaptations? Oh, yes. I mean, I will watch all of them. Like, I think there are like five or six of like the A Cinderella Story movies. And I have seen almost all of them. I think there's like one more that's like a Cinderella Story Christmas that I have not seen but it's on my wish list of things to watch. So I will pretty much watch or read any sort of retelling, you know, like um, A Curse of Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kimmer, who that's a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Um, just, oh, so many. I'm like staring at my bookshelves right now being like, look at them all. Like, oh, anything and everything that's fairy tale retelling, I will pretty much pick up. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. Um, is that one of your favorite genres? I think it is. I just, I love the magic and I love a good happy ending as well. And I'm not going to say that there's not going to be like strife or hard things that happen in the book. Um, but I love that there's always hope that things can turn out all right. And so that's what I love about fairy tales and the magic involved with them. And just, you know, I grew up watching Disney and I still think that there's a chance that I'll be a Disney princess someday, somehow. Um, you can do it. I believe right? in you. I just need like a, a little like sidekick creature character and I will be all set, you know? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So that's definitely how I see my life going, right? Oh, yeah. I have want to be Disney princess solidarity with you here. Oh, yes, I feel that. <laughs> Do you like contemporary retellings? I've I've seen some of these before where it's like Cinderella. This is actually one that I watched and I loved it. But it was like <laughs> um, Cinderella, but their prince is like a shoemaker. And it was like this. It was set for modern times. Do you like Ooh. those as well? I would totally check them out. I think I love the fantasy ones more, but I would definitely still read modern ones like you have like geekerella by like ashley poston um and things like that that are still really awesome so i would probably read pretty much any one of them <laughs> yeah so what do you like about the fantasy genre i love that you can have 
dragons and griffins and unicorns and elves and so many different creatures. Um, but you can tie that all up with like real world issues. You know, like I said, Princess Korra gets bullied and there's rumors about her. Um, and she's not the strongest when she starts out. And I think that's a really good message that I think young readers especially need today to know that like you might be facing these things and other people have faced these things but hopefully once you see your favorite characters doing them you can kind of learn to overcome them and so I love that you can kind of interweave these real world issues within fantasy and still have a fun adventure whether that's dragons or pirates um, or bears oh my no <laughs> um, all that kind of fun stuff um, so and I love magic I just love the different ways that magic can function um, and you really only get that in fantasy I mean you can have some like contemporary that's still like got some fantasy in it but um, fantasy is just my it's just my favorite genre it's where my heart belongs I feel like oh it's it's so good do you have any favorite fantasy books that you would like to shout out oh man so many I mean some of them I've already mentioned you know like um like Frostblood is such a good one and uh Caraval is really cool it, it's got a really interesting kind of magic bit to it um I'm trying to think like what else they're just so many good ones um dune i really liked dune by Lori langdon and carrie corp that's like a ya version of outlander where Ooh. they go back in time it's almost like a brigadoon retelling um if you've seen that musical and so i really love that one too um so yeah oh just so so many that i love and <laughs> I like I, Wheel of time that's a that's an adult series but still got really cool magic that's awesome. I just wanted to shout one out, and also you might like this book as well. Um, anyone who listens to this show knows that I am absolutely obsessed with the Throne of Glass series. So oh, yeah. I just wanted to mention that. So if yes. you like these other recommendations, that is another excellent high fantasy, lots of magic. Yes. I always need good recommendations, too. Um when I get the time to read, I finally will someday. Someday I will. Like I just finished, oh, I just finished um, Fable by Adrian Young, which has pirates in it. And it's very visceral, like very gritty um, about a, a pirate kind of girl who gets stranded on a really awful island and has to make her way off of it to find her father. Um, and she's got like, it's not a ton of magic, but just a touch of magic in there. That's really cool. Um, or like uh, Daughter of the Pirate King. That's another oh. fun one. Yeah. Yeah, I read that one. That was a, I, I really liked that book. Yes. Yes. I still need to read the sequel to that one. Huh. I, I need more time. I need more more hours in my day. Yeah, I, I have the same issue. It's like either I'm writing or I'm I'm I either I want to be writing or I want to be reading, but I usually just end up like doing something else because I totally forget. Right. Or I just end up scrolling through Facebook or I pop on the TV and I'm like, yeah, I'll watch more HGTV because why not? Like Oh yeah, it's it's the writer's dilemma. It's I know, rough. right? Yeah, See, having that like song or some sort of trigger helps, even if it's just like if there's a specific room you write in. Like walking into that room can kind of trigger it. Like I actually, um, this is kind of a fun story of, again about listening to music. So there's a song that comes on at the end of a couple of the "Say Yes to the Dress" episodes, which I love that show. I'm not gonna lie, you guys, I love looking at wedding dresses, um, even though I'm not married. It's fine. Um, and there's a song that comes on at the end of those episodes. And I started writing to that song. So then anytime I would watch that show and that song would come on, it was like Pavlov's bell. It was like ringing. And I was like, I should be writing right now. So maybe train yourself of like, you have a song that you love. Like if you love watching Friends, turn on the Friends theme song when you're writing. And then you'll hear that song. And you'll be like, oh, I need to go write. That is so fascinating. I'm totally <laughs> going to have to try that. Yes, it might take a couple weeks of just like listening to that song to get it like as a habit, but I think it really did work. Yeah, that's so cool. All right. Well, that was all I have for you today. I just have, well, no, that was not all I have. I have one more question. Okay. What do you have coming up? Oh, well, I'm definitely working on a new standalone novel that's not a fairy tale retelling. It's just its own thing. So that's something new for me. Um, I'm only about halfway through it right now. So I don't want to say too much just in case. Um, but I'm really excited about it. It's such a fun story. Really fun world. No magic involved, but um, just a lot of fun. That sounds great. Yeah, everybody go read all of Annie's books. She's amazing. If you liked listening to this, you can listen to the other interviews and discussions and read all the books that we mentioned here. Do you have anything else to add? 
No, I just want to say thank you all so much for listening. I loved being here today. Thank you so much for being on. You were a great guest. Oh, for, thank you. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. I'm Annie Sullivan. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The, the end. end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at readbetweenthelinespodcast. Thank you so much for listening.